Hello beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. Today we are here to talk about some of my toxic or weird bookish traits and habits. So last week I posted somewhat of a chatty discussion video on some things that you will likely never see on my booktube channel and I kind of enjoy doing that style of a format of a video where I'm not necessarily talking about specific books but I'm talking about other things within the bookish realm. And so the one that I'm going to be doing today is another one that I had seen floating around and I thought it was pretty fun and interesting and I wanted to go ahead and do it too. So today we're going to talk about some of my bookish traits and habits that could be considered toxic and if not toxic perhaps weird and unusual. I have a handful that I'm going to mention here today. They're not going to be discussed in any particular order, just in the order that I wrote them down. And we're just going to go ahead and jump right in. So this first one is probably not going to be a big surprise to all of you who have been with my channel for any length of time, but I fully admit to being a special edition whore. So in theory, I would love to just pick up special editions of books that I know that I love, but I will also pick up special editions of books that are on my radar and that I want to make sure that I have the special editions of for when I do read them, or I will absolutely pick up special editions of books that weren't even on my radar before seeing that special edition because I love the edition so much that it is actually enticing me to read it. Of course there are instances when that really doesn't work out so well. I will see special editions of books and I will purchase them because they were on my radar or they were put on my radar because of the special editions and then I will read them and I will not love them. Now of course I'm only purchasing these when I actually have the ability and means to do so. I'm not trying to put myself into financial ruin for these special editions although there are some that I would probably be willing to go into financial ruin for like the Illumicrate edition of Empire of the Vampire by Jay Kristoff. I'm just saying if you have it you want to sell it to me hit me up. But yes I love a good special edition. I fully admit that I am a book collector. I love having books on my shelves especially books that I love and especially beautiful books and so I will definitely go out of my way to purchase a special edition book if I really really want to have it on my shelves. In fact that kind of leads me into my next point in the fact that even though I've gotten so 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 much better about my book buying habits I'm so much more mindful and intentional with the books that I bring into my home. I still have not been 100% great about preventing myself from bringing books into my home that I know there is a strong possibility I may never want to read. So these are books that capture my attention for some type of reason and like I'll read the synopsis and I'll be like hmm that actually sounds kind of cute. I might want to give it a try but deep inside like my gut feeling about these books is you're never going to be in the mood to read that. And so if I'm not going to be in the mood to read it it would take a momentous amount of energy for me to actually pick up that book and read it if that makes sense. A big goal of mine over the past couple of years has been to whittle down my book buying and I've certainly been very successful. However, there have still definitely been a handful even this year already of books that I have brought into my home because something inside me was like, yeah, you probably might want to read this. But yet instinctually, I'm looking at it and like, do you though? Sure enough, they're here. They're sitting on my TBR. I haven't read them yet and I am not excited at all to read them. In fact, seeing them on my shelves and the idea of reading them is actually making me kind of cranky. And so I'm going to unhaul them and I'm just going to try to do better in the future. Now, that is certainly not the norm. That is certainly not something that I'm doing all the time but I am still actively bringing books into my home that I'm not super excited about and I know that there's every chance that I will never read and so that is something that I'm supposed to stamp out entirely but until I do that is still a very weird or toxic bookish trait and habit that I have and unfortunately it is what it is at this point. Now there are kind of weird habit that I have that a lot of people might think is really unusual is that even though I am a book collector and I love having a large collection of books chances are I will never actually physically read the books that I own. If you have been with my channel for any length of time you all know that I struggle to sit down and physically read a book. I have to be fully relaxed in order to be in the mood to physically read. I cannot read to relax. And so those opportunities when I'm fully relaxed, when I have nothing else on my mind, nothing else that I know that I should be doing to actually sit down and read, it almost never happens. And so 99% of what I read these days is listened to via audiobook. So if I physically own the book, I will still likely listen to it via audio or, and this kind of gets into the weirder aspect of it is I will listen to a book. And then if I love it, then I will go ahead and purchase it and add it to my collection even though I know that I'm never going to physically read that book. Now in some ways that could be seen as beneficial because for the most part a lot of the books that I'm bringing into my home are books that I've already read because I've listened to them but at the same time if I know that I'm never going to physically read the book why do I feel the need to own it? I don't know. I really wish that I could answer that question. I tend to be a pretty minimalist person in a lot of areas of my life but when it comes to books I just love collecting them. I love having a big library of books. I love seeing them on my shelves and I don't 
don't know if that's ever something that's going to really fully change. It could evolve and adapt over time as I get older, especially as I grow more and more impatient with clutter and just having an abundance of stuff. But in general, my books are all here. They're beautifully organized on my shelves. They're out of the way and they just bring me a happiness when I see them. And so I don't anticipate ever not wanting to have these books in my life. And I can't imagine loving a book and not having it on my shelves, if that makes sense. So if I'm listening to a book and I absolutely love it, I want to have it on my shelves. So that I would say is one of my weirder bookish traits and habits that I have. All right. And something else that I do that could be considered a little bit sketch is that because I actually have four different email addresses, I will tend to use them to sign up for different things like Audible or Scribd just to get the free trial for a limited amount of time. Now hear me out. Because I listen to audiobooks at such an alarming rate, I have an Audible subscription that I pay for every month. I have a Scribd subscription that I pay for every month. And I do have library memberships that I pay for. And I'll get to that in just a second because that's another potentially weird, unusual trait that I have. So I have multiple resources for obtaining audiobooks. But as probably most of you know, Scribd limits the books that you can read or listen to. I don't know how they decide when to limit you. I think it is kind of determined based on what you are listening to. Like if you are listening to a lot of popular reads, they'll kind of put the kibosh on you. And so you'll only be able to access very specific titles. And so there are times when I'm heavily using Scribd because the books are not available at my library and I really don't want to use an Audible credit because they are on Scribd, right? I'm only going to use an Audible credit if I absolutely have to because Audible is by far the most expensive audiobook subscription. So I'm really only going to use Audible credit if the book is not on audio anywhere else. If I can put it on hold at my library, even if it means I'm waiting a long time, I'm going to put it on hold at my library. If it's available on Scribd, I'm going to listen on Scribd. And for the most part, it's never like an urgent matter. So if I have to wait until my next billing cycle to listen to a book on Scribd, that's fine. But there are some instances when I do need more immediate access to a book and it's not available at my library, or I'm going to have to wait weeks and weeks and weeks for it. And it's available on Scribd, but I don't have access to it because I have to wait until my next billing period. And so to avoid using an Audible credit, if I have the availability, I will go and I will create a new account on Scribd in order to get a free trial. Now I'm not creating new email addresses specifically for this purpose. No, I'm not doing that. I will use one of the email addresses that I do actively use and check that doesn't have a Scribd membership attached to it and I will sign up. Do I feel bad about it? Not particularly because I still am actively maintaining a monthly subscription to Scribd. And because I'm paying for that, I don't necessarily feel like I should be limited in what I'm allowed to listen to, right? I'm paying a monthly fee for the ability to access Scribd's library and then they are restricting their library to me. And so I kind of feel like they're backtracking on their promises to me as a subscriber. I've been a subscriber of Scribd for many, many years at this point, And I will continue to be a subscriber of Scribd because this is still one of the only places that you can listen to multiple books at a time during the month without using multiple credits like you would have to on Audible. But I am a little salty about the fact that I am paying for this service and I'm not getting full access to this service throughout the month. So if I am in dire need of an audiobook for a specific book that I cannot access, I am not above going on and creating a new account to secure a free trial for 30 days. Not gonna lie. And then going back to the library thing. So my local library system here where I am in South Mississippi is very, very small. Their collection of audiobooks is absolutely atrocious. Back when I was still using the local library system, I think I would maybe find one audiobook out of 30 or 40 that I actually searched for. It was certainly not a reliable resource. And then during the pandemic, I was told about libraries that would actually allow you for an annual fee to pay to be able to use their catalog. And so at the time I did the Brooklyn Public Library in New York. They now no longer offer that service anymore. So my membership was canceled, which is unfortunate because they were by far the best one that I've had. But I do still maintain annual memberships at libraries that are outside of my state so that I have much easier access to a wider variety of audiobooks. And these memberships truly saved my life because a lot of the audiobooks that I listen to are audiobooks that I get from these libraries. And it saves me from having to use a bunch of Audible credits. It saves me from having to have multiple script accounts that I actually pay for all the time, which I did have in the past. So I don't know if anybody else does this, but they have truly been a lifesaver. And the current ones that I use are the Queens Public Library in New York, as well as the Broward County Library in Florida. And Broward County is definitely the best, I feel, in my opinion. But I do know that there are other libraries that will allow you to do this. Like, I think it's the Houston Library in Texas. I think they do allow it as well. So if that's something that you want to look into, by all means, go for it because it truly has been a lifesaver for me. And I had this as a separate point, but I've already kind of touched upon it and I've touched upon it multiple times over my channel. And that's just the fact that I really cannot read physically anymore. When I was young, I used to devour books physically all of the time. And then as I got older and I started to have more and more going on in life, like working and going to school, I really had no time or energy 
to spare for books. And then when I started to get a little bit more mellow and I, but I was still in school, like my brain could not even fathom the idea of sitting down and reading a book for pleasure when the majority of my time was reading textbooks for school. While I was in my undergrad, which took me many, many years because I was always working full time. So I was never a full time student. I was just kind of plugging along during my undergrad. But during this time when it took me all of those years to earn it, I was not reading physically. And then I found by the time that I was actually done with my undergrad and I was getting back into books and wanting to read, I just could not sit down and read physically. I did not have the concentration to do it. Everything would go in one ear and out the other. I wasn't retaining any information. And I'm so glad that I discovered audiobooks because I don't know if I would be the reader that I am today or even a reader at all if I did not have audiobooks. So do I wish that I could sit down and read physically? Sometimes yeah. And I still do read physically like big chunky epic fantasies. I typically do immersion reading with those where I'm listening and reading at the same time. That is still something that I have to have the time and the mental capacity to do to actually sit down and be able to sit still and read. And so I think that probably puts me on the more unusual scale in terms of booktubers who primarily just read physically or they can't stand audiobooks or they have a lot of specifics in terms of which audiobooks that they can listen to. That's not me. I will listen to almost absolutely anything that I'm reading on audio. And if it doesn't have an audiobook, I'm likely not going to read it unless it is one of those big chunky high epic fantasies. So I definitely do think that kind of makes me unusual in comparison to a lot of the other booktubers out there. Something else that I've noticed about myself, and it is also something that I've mentioned before, is that I don't read a lot of happy books. And in fact, happy and fun books, and especially super fast paced books, don't really work for me. I'm a very character driven reader. I need complex character dynamics. I need well developed characters. I need a lot of the depth that comes with those aspects in order for me to really connect with and love a story. Even though I do not consider myself an emotional person, unless it's with regard to animals, like I think that's like the one aspect where I get truly emotional is with animals. But for the most part, I'm not an emotional person. You have to appeal to me with logic and rationality and things like that and not emotion. But even though I might be considered like emotionally scented as a human being in my books, I need all of the emotion. I need all of that emotion in order to fully connect with and love a story. Some of my favorite books of all time are books that have just had me sobbing by the end because a book that can elicit that type of reaction out of me 100% deserves to be classified as my favorite. And I just feel like having those well developed complicated characters adds so much depth and substance to the story. And that's really what I'm looking for when I'm looking to read. So while I can appreciate fun fast paced books that are just a good time that might be a palate cleanser or things like that, they are nothing that's going to stick with me and they are nothing that I'm going to prioritize. Out of all of the books in the world that I want to read, knowing that I do not have the capacity to read all of these books in my lifetime, I really want to prioritize the ones that I know are going to give me a huge gut punch that are going to last in my mind and my heart basically for the rest of time. So I definitely look for the more emotional, sad, gritty, dark, disturbing, any type of really intense emotion. That is what I'm looking for in a story. I don't know if that makes me weird. I'm not sure if anybody else is like that, but I'm certainly not really aiming for the happy books. Even romances in which you know that they're going to have a happy ending and you want them to have that happy ending. I'm looking for a lot of obstacles between them and that happy ending. Not conflict for conflict's sake, but a lot of serious things that they have to overcome and get through in order to get to that happy ending. So in my books, I'm definitely looking for all of the emotion. And of course, I could not do this video without talking about series. Y'all know that a big goal of mine this year has been to make progress with series, especially since I was at the point in a lot of series where I only had like one or two books left. And I was like, you know what? It's time to just finish these series. And the reason why I've had to do this is because I am flipping terrible about completing series. And the reason why, and I guess this could be considered a separate point, but we'll kind of lump it all in together, is because I cannot binge a series. Even if I'm completely in love with the book that I just finished, my instinct when I finish that book is never to jump immediately right into the next book in that series. And I don't know why that is. I'm not sure what it is in me that feels the need to have breaks in between books, but those breaks are never a standard amount of time. I could go years between a book in the series. Now I'm certainly a lot better about this. So I've made a lot of progress in a lot of series this year and I've definitely unhauled or DNF'd a lot of series over the past year or two as well. And so I'm certainly whittling down the series that I'm in the middle of, but I don't think that I'll ever get to a point where I can binge a series. So anytime I start a series, I start a series with the knowledge that it could take me years to finish no matter how many books are in that series because I just cannot read them back to back to back to back. There will always be breaks of some kind in between. So that is definitely like a toxic trait I have is that I am terrible about finishing series. And the only reason why I'm finishing series this year is because I've made it an active priority. And luckily for the most part, I've only started a couple of series this year. A lot of the first books 
books and series that I've started this year I have not wanted to continue with so I haven't really added a lot of series into that as well so I'm making good progress but yeah it's definitely always going to be a weird trait of mine that I do not want to binge series and I take long breaks in between those books so completing them is very difficult and the last weird habit I think I want to talk about today is DNFing books I am actually either a very early DNFer or I won't DNF at all so there will be times when I will start a book and I will know within just a chapter or two that I'm not going to enjoy this book or that I'm not in the mood for this book that I don't like the writing that I'm probably going to hate the book if I were to read it all and so I will outright DNF it the vast majority of books that I DNF are DNF'd at this stage like they are DNF'd before the 50 page mark but if I make it past that point I will likely continue if it is not an early DNF I'm likely not to DNF the Atlas Paradox is probably the first time ever or at least the first time in recent memory that I have DNF'd a book after the 100 page mark I just kept pushing and pushing and pushing myself through it until I finally got to the point where I was like it's been 100 pages absolutely nothing has happened I hate all of these characters why am I still reading this book and I went ahead and I DNF'd it but for the most part I'm going to know within a chapter or two whether or not I'm going to like this book or I'm going to feel in the mood to read this book so yes I am a very very early DNFer or I will not DNF at all I will push my way through the story even if I'm not loving the story overall because I've made it past a certain point and I feel like I can continue and I can get through it even if I know that I'm not going to love the story and I would say that I still DNF very very rarely but those DNFs were likely going to be very easy DNFs all right y'all so those were some of my weird slash toxic bookish traits and habits I would love to know if you have some of the same habits as I do or what you feel some of your toxic or weird bookish habits are please comment down below and let me know I would definitely love to hear this from you and as always if you like this video or if you just like me please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already I am to post one video sometimes two depending on what I could do and I would sure love to connect with you in one of those next videos or connect with you on any of the other platforms I'm a part of I always leave links to my Instagram Goodreads and IG threads down below and I would love to chat with you there until next time guys